Listen, today we're going to wrap up this series on Philippians where uh, if you've been coming for the last several weeks, you, you know that the key theme in this is joy. Somebody say joy. Say it like you got to say joy. So today we're going to take a look at chapter three and then we're going to touch chapter four. And I, I want to do this from the subject, from the thought today, really from the theme. Here it is. The joy of life in Christ. The joy of life, but not just life, the joy of life in Christ, the joy of life in Christ. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Billy Sunday. How many of you ever heard that name, Billy Sunday? He was a major league center fielder and he later became an evangelist and became very, very, very popular. People would often remark when they would go to his uh, crusades and his services about his exuberant, extravagant joy. People would say you couldn't get around him without it just emanating off of him and getting on to you. He was so passionate about Jesus, so passionate, so full of enthusiasm and joy. And Billy Sunday once said this. He said, if you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. If you have no joy today, here's what Billy Sunday would have said to you. He would have said there must be a leak somewhere in this Christian faith of yours because to be a Christian and not have joy means something is causing you to lose that joy. There are joy thieves in our lives. And, and how many of you know there are lots of them, all kinds of them, things that would try to do their best to steal my joy, to take your joy, things like fear and doubt, things like sin and secret sin, Things like overworking, things like sickness and disease. Some of you are going through something where you have chronic pain and, and it can be easy for those things to steal and rob you of your joy. Some of you, you've, you've been robbed of your joy in seasons of your life because of grief or loss or pain or even shame because of something that was said about you or something that was found out about you that was revealed or exposed. And by the way, as we get into this message today, let's not forget what we've established throughout this series. Let's not forget who's writing it and where he's writing it from. We're talking about Paul the Apostle, and he's writing this letter from a prison. He's locked up, and he knows he may die. But he's talking about joy. As he's writing a letter to his Christian Friends, his church family, you could even say, people that he loved, that he had relationships with, that he knew their names and their faces. And he's talking to them while in chains, while on the verge of being persecuted to death for his faith in Jesus. And he still finds joy in Jesus. Second <laughs> Corinthians chapter 11, Paul the Apostle describes his Christian journey up until that point. And I just want you to look at this with me. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times he had to go through this kind of, of, of violence and, and abuse. Five times he says, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. Man, somebody needs to build better boats. I mean, come on. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, and in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. He says, I have labored and toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I've gone often without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So, how are you doing? How are we doing today, okay? Paul, all of this, and, and, and yet he stayed anchored to Jesus. I hope if we don't get anything else through this study and this, this looking at Philippians, that we, that we get this, that no matter what Paul went through, he stayed connected, he stayed grounded, he stayed rooted in Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is why he had joy in the midst of terrible circumstances. Despite everything he went through, he's still trusting in Jesus. Despite everything he went through, he still found joy. Where? In Jesus. Not in his circumstances, not in his surroundings, not in his situation. His joy wasn't based on what was happening to him because remember, happiness comes from happenings. But joy doesn't come from what's happening outside. It comes from something that's happening and has happened on the inside. Can you say amen? 
So this is why Paul says in chapter 3, verse 1, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. This, I found this week in my study, was actually a command. The way that he penned these words on these pages of parchment where he was in this prison, this was a command to them. He's saying, finally, furthermore, listen in, lean in. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And I found out in the original language, it's what's called the present active indicative, which would literally be translated this way. He's saying, Rejoice in the Lord and be continually rejoicing. In other words, his language would have implied to them that this isn't you do this one time. It implies that you always continuously rejoice in the Lord. And that tells me something about joy. It tells me that joy has, has much less to do with what's going on around you. And it has so much more to do with what's going on inside you. That no matter what's going on around you, you can respond to that with joy. I think it also implies that this is a choice we make every day. That, that this isn't an automated response. This is a learned response. Like I don't just wake up, joy! I gotta wake up and choose joy. It's not just automatic it's it's learned I can prove it how do you know that pastor Daniel so glad you asked let's go to chapter 4 verse 11 Paul says for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances so Paul saying I learned this and I'm continuing to learn this this is why later on in chapter 3 he'll say not that I have already attained all this but but, I, but one thing I do I press on toward the goal in other words this mature Christian believer was, was, was humble enough to say I'm telling you the way it should be and I'm also telling you I got to keep making this choice every day I got to make this decision every day I got to choose joy but I'm encouraging you as I'm encouraging myself let's keep on continuously rejoicing in the Lord regardless of what it may look like it's a choice we make it's a choice to make joy our outlook we need to make Jesus our uplook we need to say regardless of what's happening down here my eyes are on you we got to stop trying to fix everything down here and do what the Bible says fix our eyes on Jesus who is the author and finisher perfecter of our faith rejoice in the Lord be continually rejoicing let's keep reading let's keep going but but don't also lose the fact that he doesn't say rejoice period he says, rejoice in the Lord. Because he's saying, if you try to rejoice because of the reasons you have in front of you to rejoice, you may not always rejoice. But there's something on the inside that never changes. There's something on the inside that's already taken care of the thing you're struggling and you're worried about tomorrow. There's something on the inside greater. See, the problem, I think, one of the reasons why some people don't experience joy in their Christian walk is because they are looking for it, trying to find it in all the wrong places. You're trying to find joy in another person or in another thing or in another check or another opportunity when joy doesn't come from any of those places. You, you got to stop looking for something else or someone else to produce it in you because it won't happen. So whenever our circumstances aren't what we hope they would be, sometimes we just need to do what I would call a spiritual reality check. Like if things are real bad and I, don't, I feel like something's trying to rob my joy, I, I, I'm leaky, you know, my Christianity's leaking somewhere, I, I just don't have that joy. I, I just need to take a moment and do a spiritual reality check. God is still on the throne, check. I'm a child of God, check. No weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper, check. I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. Check. My strength doesn't come from my circumstances. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Check. He didn't lead me here this far just to lead me here. The Bible says he has plans to prosper me, to give me a hope and a future. Check. Jesus died for me. He shed his blood for me. I'm forgiven. I have grace. I have. See, see, I've got a purpose in God. Check. So what am I worried about? What am I stressed about? See, sometimes we just got to remind ourselves of a spiritual truth that's bigger than what's in front of us. See, because there's a difference between the facts and the truth. You know that, right? Like, like the, the facts may say one thing, but the truth is even, is even greater than the facts. The fact is just a description of the present state of something, but it doesn't speak to the future state of something. So, so the facts may be you're addicted, but the truth is who the sun sets free is free indeed. So you can have joy while you're addicted to something today. Not because you're okay with it, but because you believe God's helping you come out of it. See, see, it's, there's a difference between the facts and the truth. The facts about Moses was he was a st st stutterer. 
But God said, the truth is, you're a mouthpiece to a generation for me. Because only God can take your weakness and turn it around for his glory and show people he's good enough, he's big enough, he's grand enough, he's strong enough. So I, I can find joy when I take my eyes off of the natural and I put my eyes on the supernatural divine things that God is doing in my life. So let's keep reading. Verse 2, watch out, he says to the church, he says, watch out for those dogs those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Whoa, Paul, strong words. This is, this is some dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. Don't have time to go really, really deep here today, but basically, Paul's warning them against false teachers. Not against, not against some, you know, murderous, sinful prostitution ring. No, he's talking about religious people. He's talking about people who are trying to convince everybody else that they got it all together. He's talking about religious elites, specifically Judaizers. These are people who mix the grace of Jesus Christ with the law of the Old Testament, so much so that they believed you needed both in order to be right with God. And maybe you're sitting there saying, well, praise God, thank God there's no people like that today. Really? Mm-hmm. See, they believed you, you needed both in order to be saved. But listen, you would be shocked how people, saved people, Christian people, believe that you get right with God by your good works. So I'm going to do a ceremony. I'm going to do a ritual I'm going to go through a thing. I'm going to do good. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to earn my way. Paul says, you're an evildoer. That's harsh. Why such strong language about people who at least believed? Because when anyone says, I get right with God by doing good works, what they are in effect saying is this. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross was not good enough. Let that sink in. I need to add to that finished work. I need to add to that work some of my own goodness, some of my own righteousness to make that a finished work. Now, I'm not saying that I don't think Christians should have good works. Absolutely not. But what I am saying is the good works, hear me, are a byproduct of your relationship with God. The works I do for him have to be a byproduct of the love I have for him. That I'm not doing this to impress him or anyone else. That's religious folk. That's the legalistic folks. Judaizers actually taught that uh, circumcision was vital to salvation. And you can go and read about that law that they believed in in Acts 15.1. Talk, Paul talks about it. And so that's why in verse 3, we're going to look at this. As opposed to these false religious legalists, look at what Paul says. He says, for it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Whoo, man, that is a mouthful. Paul says so much in just one verse here. I'm going to read it again. Leave it up. He says, for it is we. He's calling out the religious folks to say, you got to go through this ritual to be saved. He's calling it out. He says, for it is we who are the circumcision. He says, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, but our confidence is in Christ. He says, we are the circumcision, not by physical signs. He's saying not by outward marks, but by an inward transformed heart and spirit. I'm teaching. I hope you catch this. We serve God by his spirit. I hope you join the dream team. I hope you join the team that makes ministry happen in so many places in our church. But when you join the dream team, please serve by his spirit and not by your works. We serve God by his spirit. What does that really mean? It means our actions and it means our attitudes are guided by him and his power, not our own efforts. So there's an inward reality to the outward ritual that I'm participating in. Today when we take communion, it is the exact same thing. It's not taking the piece of bread. It's not tipping up the little cup of juice that's doing something significant. It's the spirit 
of God that's here with you as you partake, that he's with you. There is a spiritual thing that happens in communion that's so much greater than just, it made me feel good because it tipped up the cup. No, 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 no. You're identifying with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And there's a spiritual reality that's greater than what's happening on the outside. Are you with me? I'm telling you this because legalism won't tell you this. We serve God by his spirit. And then he talks about boasting in Christ. I don't want to skip beyond this. We're kind of doing some expository teaching. So let me just speak to that. Boasting in Christ means I'm giving him the glory in everything I do. I'm relying on him and not me. I'm relying on his strength and his giftings, not my own skills and abilities. And, and, and this is important because legalism will minimize the work of Jesus and maximize the work of man. And I don't ever, ever want to meander into that place. And finally, he says, and put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we have to depend totally on Jesus. Today, I, I hope you understand when I say I'm preaching this, I'm preaching to, to spouses. I'm preaching to parents. I'm preaching to sons and daughters. I'm preaching to co-laborers in Christ. I'm preaching to those of you who serve on a ministry team here. And I'm preaching to those of you who don't, but you're busy doing other things. But are you doing it out of your own effort? Or are you doing it as worship unto the Lord? Someone asked me this week, hey, if I decided to go into this career path, could I do that for the Lord? I said, absolutely. Pretty, pretty much any career path, short of sinful ones, you can do that as unto your worship, as unto the Lord. And they, and they were, yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm like, you don't have to be in ministry. No, the things you do for the Lord, you do more. I, I feel like I, being a pastor, there are times where I have to do more ministry in my own home with my own family than I'm doing here because God has called me as a husband and as a dad, come on men, to be the leader in my home. And so I don't do that by my, I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not man enough. I need Jesus to be a man of God. Y'all gonna leave me up here all by myself. All right, man. Somebody say, amen. Amen, Pastor Daniel. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, this ought to be a, a, a breath of fresh air, is that you don't have to put confidence in yourself. Because here, here's the reality, as I, as I get ready to land the plane today, I want you to understand, the humanist message is this, you gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps, boy. You know, you gotta do something for yourself, because God helps those who help themselves. Wait a minute, where is that in the Bible? I don't see that, it's Proverbs 32, what? I don't see. Proverbs 32, get it later, never mind. The humanist message is, do it for yourself. Well, but, but the legalist message is, you gotta work yourself to heaven. You gotta keep the rituals, you gotta keep the ceremonies, you gotta cross your fingers and hope it's good enough. But that's not our message. Our message is Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's our message. That's our gospel. That's why it's good news. And listen, that'll bring you joy. Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all because Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life, help me, abundantly to the full. Here's my question today. Before we take communion together, is there a leak in your Christianity somewhere? Has something in this season Maybe this week, maybe this morning, maybe in the car ride on the way to church. Don't look to the left or to the right. Something happened and it stole your joy. Maybe if you're honest with yourself as you sit here and listen to me speak these words today, you're almost, you're almost wanting to run up here and say, it's not that easy, Pastor Daniel. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm dealing with. And you're right, for some of you, I don't know. But I absolutely know that the Holy Spirit is sufficient and God's grace is sufficient I know because I've been in dark places I've been at places of despair and I thought there's 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 just nothing left for me to do and God said thank you I'll take it from here so today maybe we just need to listen to that old Carrie Underwood song and switch seats and get out of the driver's seat and let Jesus take the wheel so I trust you I can't control it, I've tried. I can't hit the brakes, I've tried. I can't accelerate this thing, God. You know I've tried. I, I don't have any joy in what I'm trying so hard to do, but my joy, like Paul's, is in Jesus. So with heads bowed and eyes closed today, before we take communion, I have just a few questions to add to that one significant question I have already asked, which is, is there a leak 
in your Christianity somewhere. My question really is, is it, it, do, you, do you have joy? And if you find your joy waning today, I want you to take a moment in this time of reflection to just reflect on your relationship with Jesus. Are you anchored to him? Are you in relationship with him? Are you in close proximity? Are you rejoicing in his presence? Are you aware of those things that are seeking to steal your joy? Today, my prayer for you is that you would be like Paul, who despite his circumstances, found joy in Christ. Lord, my prayer is that we would serve you by your spirit, that we would boast not in ourselves, but in you, that we would put no confidence in the flesh. And in doing so, I believe we're gonna experience the true and lasting joy that comes only from a life connected to you, Lord, anchored to you, Jesus. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, before we take Holy Communion together today, we need to pause for this moment because really, truly, to come around the communion table with your church family, the only prerequisite to that is that you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. So if you're here today and you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus is Lord, then I wanna give you that opportunity and we wanna pray with you. Or maybe you're in the room or watching online and you've prayed a prayer like this before, but if you're honest with yourself, you, you've sort of gone your own way and the reason why you've lost joy is because your joy has been based on someone else or something else and it'll never fully produce it in you. Only a life in Christ allows you to experience true joy. And Lord, today with heads bowed and eyes closed, I wanna pray with my brothers and sisters who may need to place faith in you for the very first time or maybe the 15th time, but today is significant because of this message of joy. Lord, I know there's a lot of things that are attempting to steal joy in people and in families across this room and through those cameras right now. But Lord, I pray that by faith, we would make a decision today to trust you on the journey and to find our joy, not in what we can do or not in our own skills and efforts and plans for the future, but God, I pray for husbands and wives and moms and dads and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and friends and co-laborers that Lord we would spur one another on because of the joy that's in my heart it'll make a difference in my family because of the joy that's in Heather's heart it would make a difference in my life and in Zion's and in Graceland's life because of the joy of people in this room who serve our church. People are going to come through those doors and some of our services and they're going to experience joy because you've done something in us. There's an inward reality that's producing a life devoted to you on the outside. Lord, we don't live from legalism. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that any of us in this room today, if we've been convicted by this, Lord, I know there have been times where you, you have taken me to the woodshed on this one, Lord. You said, Daniel, are you, are you doing this? to impress? Are you doing this to show me? So are, are you doing this because you just choose me? Lord, we humble ourselves. I pray that we would be a church committed to being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus and doing what Jesus did. And Lord, we'd want that for our lives more than we want anything else that we would find our joy in you. And oh God, may it be true about each and every one of us that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. We have so bowed and eyes so close. If you're in here and you say, Pastor Daniel, I wanna pray. I want you to pray for me, a sinner's prayer so that I can devote my life to Jesus. If that's you, I'm gonna give you that opportunity. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, but on the count of three, would you just wave one hand at me so I see who you are? Just hold it up so I see it really quick. One, two, three, hands are going up, thank you. Hands are going up around the room, on the front, in the middle, on the sides. I see that, sir, see that hand, thank you, sir, in the middle, on the side, second row. Yeah, see that hand, thank you. Hands going up all over the room. Maybe there's hands going up online. You can raise your hand in the chat, say it's me, someone pray with me and someone will. If you raised your hand, or even if you didn't, but you know you need to pray this prayer, just repeat this simple prayer after me. Before we come together around the communion table, let's make sure we're right with God. Jesus, we love you. 
Would you repeat after me? Say, Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. Come on, church family, let's pray it out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for dying for me. You took my place. You paid my price. I believe that. And I received this gift of salvation. Save me from sin. Save me from myself. Empower me to be who you've called me to be. Now tell them, say, Jesus, I'll follow you every day for the rest of my life. You are my Lord and heaven is my home. Tell them that. You are my Lord and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Come on, put those hands together for anybody who prayed that prayer for the first time in the room or online. We celebrate with you. Praise God. The best choice you could make today was that choice right there. Now we're going to take communion together. And in so doing, I want to just continue in Philippians. I want to read to you Philippians 4, 4 through 7. If you have not got elements, we've got these elements in the room. If you didn't get one coming in, uh, we've got tables in the middle. And actually, we've got tables here in the front on both sides of the altar, the stage. You can feel free at any point right now to go ahead and grab those. And if you're joining us online, you can join in with us as well. Grab something real quick, maybe some bread or a cracker or some juice or even water is fine. It's a point of contact. Remember, it's not about the outward, it's about the inward, okay? So go ahead and grab some elements. And as we come to the Lord's table, I'm gonna read from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. It's on the screen. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Come on, let that minister to you today. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, how many situations? He says, from prison, he says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And I love this promise and the peace of God not just the peace the peace of God that's why the next part makes more sense now which transcends all understanding because it's the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus today as we take communion let's focus on these words he says rejoice in the Lord always regardless of the circumstances and that the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. Today, as we take the bread and the cup, we have every reason to rejoice because these symbols represent the body and blood of Jesus. And remember, there's an inward reality greater than the outward ritual. And Jesus' death and resurrection assure us that we are never alone. That's why he promised that that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Even though he left this earth, he left us with his Holy Spirit. And he is with us, hear me, in every situation. And when we remember what he did on the cross with these elements, as we take communion in just a moment, we are, by faith, we are identifying with the finished work of the cross. Your sin is forgiven and it's finished. Your pain, he takes it from you. It's it's finished, he gives you joy. Your, your physical sickness, even disease. He takes it. He, he bore stripes, it says in Isaiah. That by his stripes, you are healed. And finally, Philippians 4.19, before we take the elements, let me remind you of what this says. And my God will meet all your needs. So you got to believe that today as we get ready to take communion. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, the bread and the cup remind us that Jesus has met our deepest need, the need for salvation. So as we take communion today, go ahead and grab the bread. And I'm gonna go to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. And let's remember God who did not spare his own son, he will surely provide for all our needs. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may now take the bread. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for us. 
And so, Lord, if there's any brokenness in this room today, whether it's in minds or in hearts or souls, people who are dealing with emotions and anger and hard time trusting you, Lord, wherever we're broken, you make us whole. And you said, I make all things new. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26. In the same way as we take the cup, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And I just want to pause for a second. This is what we're talking about today. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying it's not about the old covenant where you have to work your way to God. He's saying there is a finished work. And this new covenant, this new covenant, he says, is in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You may now take the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Just take a moment and be thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for your body and your blood. You were beaten. You were broken. You were you were bruised, they, they spat on you, they cussed at you, they laughed at you, they mocked you, they pierced a crown of thorns into your head and they lashed you and beat you and they took you to the cross and they nailed your hands and your feet and they pierced you in the side, but you poured out your blood for us. At any moment, Lord, you could have called down on 10,000 angels to end it all, but you loved us too much to not take the pain that was necessary for us to have freedom and life and forgiveness and healing. So today we recognize as we finish studying Philippians that it's not by our own human effort, it's not by anything we could do to ever earn our way to you. God, nothing we can do can make you love us any less and nothing we can do can make you love us any more. You already love us unconditionally with a perfect agape love and for that, Today, we rejoice. We choose joy in you. In Jesus' name, would you stand with us? Let's worship the Lord today as we get ready to close.